Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Kristen Hennessy McDonald, and I'm a curriculum specialist with Mini PCR. I'm here with Mini PCR to introduce our Mendel's Peas Lab, which we launched in the summer of 2023. Before we dive into today's lab, I want to start with an introduction. If you're new to Mini PCR Bio, we make biotech equipment and curriculum to make it easier for teachers to equip their students with the latest biotechnology tools. Our durable, portable, and most importantly, affordable equipment is used for a number of different applications, from students in classrooms to scientific researchers in the field, including scientists at the CDC who use our equipment to monitor swine flu outbreaks. We also have all sorts of other users. Amateur mycologists use our equipment to identify foraged mushroom species. And snake breeders use our equipment to test the genetics of snakes that they want to breed to see if they have the genes for specific color morphs in ball pythons. The other side of our work is that we offer innovative lab activities to give students real hands-on experience with biotechnology so that teachers can show students how to use biotechnology tools and how they can be used to solve real world problems. The concepts of DNA structure, the central dogma, and genetics span several units in most biology classes. We often use modeling activities to bring hands-on experience to the study of molecular biology, and of course, Punnett squares to illustrate the flow of genetic information from parents to offspring. All of these are great ways to introduce students to these complex and critical pieces of the biology curriculum. The goal of the Mendel's Peas Lab is to provide a hands-on lab that allows you to bridge these concepts and link what we know about genes to the inheritance of traits. The Mendel's Peas Lab is based on authentic real-world research. So we took some pretty sophisticated work happening in the field of genetics and simplified it to make a nice, accessible, and engaging lab that can serve as an on-ramp into biotech for intra-level students to connect the genes an organism carries with the exhibited phenotype. It's a beginner-friendly introduction to electrophoresis and how it can be used to aid in genotype identification. On this screen, I've snapshotted a page of the lab guide, so you can see what I mean when I say this is targeted toward biotech beginners. The text is broken down into easy to read units and lots of information is presented visually. Assessment questions are interspersed throughout. This makes this lab accessible even to students who aren't ready for dense, text-heavy background information. Now with the Mendel's Peas Lab, students are going to accomplish their analysis using gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis is a way that we can separate molecules based on their size and charge. And if we break the word electrophoresis down, it'll tell us how we'll be doing that. Electro comes from electricity and phoresis comes from the ancient Greek and means to be carried. So we'll use electricity to carry DNA through a gel and separate it by size. At the end of the day, it's a filtration process. When we're talking about microscopic scales and complex biomolecules, it can seem intimidating. But if your students can understand training pasta in a colander, they can understand the science behind electrophoresis. Now, gel electrophoresis is most commonly used to separate and visualize DNA. This has numerous applications, including forensics and diagnostics. Gel electrophoresis is an essential method used daily in biotech, and it's a great way to integrate hands-on labs into your classes because it can be used to study many aspects of biology. To perform gel electrophoresis, all you need is a gel and a way to create an electric field through that gel. Gels are commonly made using agarose, which is a sugar derived from seaweed. It's a lot like making jello. You start with a powder, you add a set amount of liquid, you boil it, then you pour it into a mold and let it set. Once the agarose set, it really does feel like a firm jello. The important thing about the gel is that at the microscopic level, the agarose forms a web. So as molecules move through the gel, 
the web acts like a size filter. I always used to tell my students to think about a toddler and a grown adult trying to get through the same crowd. The toddler can move through spaces that the grown adult can't, and so they can move faster through that crowded room than an adult. When making the gel, we use a mold to make little pockets where we can place our samples in the gel. These pockets are called wells. And if you look at a cross section, you can see how they're just basically an indentation in the gel. This is where we'll place our samples at the start of a gel run, when the, and then the electric field will move the samples into the gel. So again, for the gel to be able to filter the molecules by size, we need to get the molecules to move through the gel. This is where the electric field comes in. Wires are placed on either end of the gel to act as a negative and positive electrode. We place a conductive material, in this case, a liquid buffer containing ions between the electrodes. The ions in the liquid buffer allow the current to flow between the positive and negative electrodes and complete that circuit. Now DNA is negatively charged, so it'll travel towards the positive electrode. Remember, the agarose forms a web that acts like a size filter. Here I've schematized a smaller piece of DNA and a larger piece. The smaller piece of DNA has an easier time moving through the web and will travel faster, while the longer piece of DNA gets caught up in the web and is going to travel more slowly. So when we start a gel electrophoresis one, all of the molecules are in the well and there could be different sized pieces of DNA in that sample. But as the gel runs, the DNA molecules separate based on length with the longest pieces of DNA traveling the shortest distance and the shortest pieces of DNA traveling the farthest. To help bring gel electrophoresis to more classrooms, we created the Bandit Stem Electrophoresis Kit. Two things make Bandit different than other gel electrophoresis systems. First, you, you and your students build the bandit to better understand how gel electrophoresis works. It ties together physical science, engineering, and the life sciences in one kit. Second, bandit is designed to use dye samples to simulate DNA. The advantage of this is that they're low cost and students are able to see the samples migrating in the gel without any other visualization equipment or secondary states. This keeps the bandit easy to use and low cost. Today, we'll be using the bandit to run the Mendel's Peace Lab. Although you can use any gel electrophoresis system to do this lab. We have another webinar de dedicated to the bandit system where we walk you through activities designed to help students really understand how gel electrophoresis works as they build their own system. You can find that video on our YouTube channel, and it's also linked in the description. So we're going to go ahead and set up our samples, then go back and discuss the scenario you'll use with your students in the classroom. While this may seem backwards, we're doing it in this order to allow the gel time to run so that you can see the results in real time. I'm going to switch to my desktop camera so you can see what I'm doing on my bench. So here I have my bandit system set up like I would receive it from mini PCR. The first thing we need to do is set up the bandit system so that we can cast an agarose gel. We're going to use these electrodams to act as the top and bottom of our gel. The electrodams, again, act as a dam when we're pouring our gel, but also act as our electrodes later. And I'm going to show you how in just a minute. So we would put our electrodams on the top and bottom. Those again are going to form the top and bottom of our gel. Then we're going to put on these comb supports. The comb supports are little pieces of rubber that essentially hold the comb in place but they also make sure that when we put the comb in, it doesn't go all the way to the bottom of, in this case, our pouring chamber. 
because if our wells went all the way through the gel, then our samples would run out the bottom and we wouldn't actually see any of our sample going into the agarose gel. So this is our comb. We're gonna use this side in this case, but you do have smaller wells if you need more samples. And we're gonna push it all the way down until it reaches that comb support. You can make sure that it's nice and square. And then from here, you take the agros, and just like making jello, you'd add a liquid, you'd boil it, and you'd put it in here. So I've already done that. And here we have our agarose gel. The first thing I'm gonna do is take out the comb. So as you can see, the comb left behind the wells, and there is where we're going to put our sample dyes. Now, I do wanna point out, with the Mendel's Peace Kit, you'll receive all of the components you need to cast your gels. So you'll get the agarose and you'll get a pouch of TBE powder that will allow you to make the, elect uh, the buffer that contains the ions. Okay, so this is Bandit in cast mode. What we're gonna do now, we don't need those comb supports anymore. So we're gonna go ahead and take those out and set them to the side. Now again, these dams form the top and bottom edges of the gel. I'm gonna take those out all the way just so that you can see how they formed the top and bottom edges of the gel. Now I said they were electrodams, so they're also going to act as our electrodes. What you do when you're building the bandit system is you're gonna thread these little grooves in the electrodams with a fine wire. These wires are going to act as your positive and negative electrodes. So, and then we've got some coming out here that I'll explain why we have that in a minute. When you are setting up your gel, one of the easiest mistakes to make is where to put your positive and negative electrode. Remember, DNA is negatively charged. And the dyes that we use in our Bandit labs, including the Mendel's Peas lab, are also negatively charged to simulate DNA. And so because they're negatively charged, we want the positive electrode to be the farthest away from the wells, because that's the direction we want them to go. You maybe can't see it here, but the electrodams have a positive, and this one has a negative um, symbol on it to tell you which way they go. They also have these little grooves along the back that fit over your uh, gel chamber to make sure that they stay in place. So again, this is my negative electrode. I'm gonna turn it around so that it's facing the right way. And there we go. Okay, so now you'll notice that after I've taken the dams out and put them back in, uh, into run mode, there is a little space. We do want that space to allow that electric current uh, to flow through the liquid rather than through the gel, because that wouldn't work very well. Okay, so we have our bandit in run mode. We're just about ready to load our samples. The last thing we need is to put our buffer in here. So again, this is just TBE buffer. Uh, you'll get a packet of the powder to make this with your kit. And this again contains ions to allow the electrical current to move from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. Okay, so we are now ready to load our samples. The other great thing about our dye lab kits is they come pre-aliquoted. So here are my samples, and they're all set up so that all the teacher needs to do is hand these out to their student groups. Um, you can tell 
which one is number one because uh, they're in eight tube sets and tubes seven and eight are empty. So this is going to be sample one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll explain what these samples are um, in a little while. I'm going to use a mini pet to uh, load my gel. Now, mini pets are uh, really fantastic fi uh, fixed volume versions of micro pipettes. Uh, this one is a 10 microliter mini pet. They're great because they're inexpensive. Each one only costs about $11 and they're much more durable than a variable volume pipette. But at the same time, they're actually a great teaching tool. So the mini pets have a first stop and a second stop, just like a variable volume pipette does. And so these are great teaching tools. You let your students learn how to micro pipette on these. And once you're sure that they're putting on the tip and using them appropriately, then you can let them use the variable volume pipettes. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and put my tip on my mini pet. Each of these has an individual lid, so you can go through them one at a time. I'm gonna go ahead and just show, I go down to the first stop and I slowly pull up my sample. And then as I'm loading my gel, I use two hands. This is because I wanna make sure that any minor shaking that I may have in my one hand doesn't cause me to lose my sample. So I'm gonna go through uh, the process of what I'm doing with this first sample and then get the rest loaded. So I'm only going to um, break the surface of the liquid just a little bit. All of our samples have loading dies that make them more dense than the TBE buffer. And so gravity will pull them into the wells. It's really important that you don't uh, stick your pipette tip too far into the wells because you could puncture the well and then lose your sample. So I'm gonna use two hands. I have my one hand driving my micro pipette, my other hand just making sure that I don't shake. And I'm gonna slowly release my sample. I'm only gonna go to the first stop because I don't want to introduce bubbles. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my second sample. Now it's standard practice in science labs to switch tips in between each sample. Um, and so teaching your students to do this as they're touching something new is, is good practice just so that they learn that they really wanna make sure they aren't contaminating anything um, a new sample. Almost there, we got two more. Sorry about that. All right, all my samples are loaded. We are ready to run. We just need to connect our electrodes to power, right? So I said I'd explain why we have these extra pieces of wire coming out. The Bandit system uses a circuit controller to connect um, an electrical current with our uh, Bandit gel electrophoresis system. So this circuit controller is great it uses a USB-C uh, to power it, so you can connect the other end of the USB-C to anything um, that will accept a USB-C, including um, an adapter, 
your computer or even a cell phone can run this, which is really cool. So you'll take your power adapter and you'll plug it in and you'll be able to tell that it's working because um, it has that green light. Now it has uh, safety features so that if the students plug in their alligator clips, they're not gonna get hurt. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our alligator clips and we're going to connect them to each of our electrodes, red to red, the red is positive. Um, again, one of the most common things when setting up electrophoresis that uh, people make the mistake about is which electrode is where. Uh, the standard is that uh, red is positive, and so I always taught run to red. My samples are going to run to the red electrode. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your alligator clip and then, sorry. You're gonna take your alligator clip and clip it on there. And then you're going to take the excess wire and wrap it around your alligator clip a few times. I do quite a few times, and that's just because I really want to make sure that that connection is stable. One or two times should be enough. Um, but again, just wrapping it around, you really want to make sure that you have that connection so that you have that complete circuit. Okay, the other end of my alligator clips is. Um, just gonna connect straight into my circuit controller. And immediately what's gonna happen is you start to see bubbles all along that negative electrode. Those bubbles are telling you that there is a current running. They actually, what is happening in the liquid is it's breaking down the water molecules. So those are bubbles of hydrogen and oxygen and they're going to um, show up all along that negative electrode and that lets you know that your sample is running because you have that complete electric current. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna leave this uh, to run and we're gonna go back and I'm gonna explain what are we running. Again, because the gels need a little time to run, we loaded them before I told you anything about the samples. So now we're gonna circle back and I'm gonna to explain to you what we're running and how you can use this in your classroom. The lab that, you're, that we're running is based on Mendel's peas. Many traits are inherited, meaning they're passed from parent to offspring. The rules of basic inheritance were deduced by Gregor Mendel in the 1800s, just by breeding, breeding pea plants and observing whether the offspring looked like either parent. Mendel selected traits that had two forms, like peas being round or wrinkled. That's what this lab focuses on. His most important conclusion was that plants inherited something from each parent that defines the plant's experience, the plant's appearance. He didn't know what this material was, but he abbreviated it using capital and lowercase letters like big A and little a. Today, we know that DNA is what is passed from parents to offspring and that Mendel was tracking alleles. Mendel actually coined the terms dominant and recessive and he used those terms to explain how some traits can skip a generation. We still use this language today to describe the relationship between alleles of the same gene that followed the simple inheritance pattern described by Mendel. For a dominant trait to show, only one of the alleles needs to be the dominant allele. But for a recessive trait to show, both alleles have to be recessive. Mendel showed that round P is the dominant trait. 
Now, one of the few things kids tend to remember from genetics is Punnett squares. Even most adults remember how to fill out a basic Punnett square, which allows you to predict the genotypes and phenotypes of offspring from a cross. In this classic example of a cross between two heterozygous parents, we get the reemergence of the recessive wrinkled trait in the offspring with a predicted ratio of three round peas to one wrinkled pea. This lab is designed to link this idea of allele abbreviations and Punnett squares with our modern understanding of DNA and inheritance. Since the 1800s, we've known that having round peas is dominant. But even linking traits like this that follow simple Mendelian inheritance patterns are actually really hard. You might be surprised to know that scientists are still trying to determine which genes Mendel was studying. So far, they've identified their genes responsible for six out of seven of the traits that Mendel was working on. In this lab, students play the role of plant geneticists, trying to link a candidate gene with Mendel's experiments. So you start off with this scenario. Your students have been upgraded to uh, students that work in a genetics lab. And they've, the genetics lab has discovered two alleles of a gene called SBE1 that determine P shape. The alleles are the same, except that one has some extra DNA near the end of the gene. For simplicity, we'll for, refer to these as the short allele and the long allele. The research from the lab has already shown that the short SBE1 allele is dominant and leads to round peas. So just to remember uh, Mendelian inheritance, round peas could be heterozygous with one copy of the dominant short SBE1 allele or homozygous with two copies of the dominant short SBE1 allele. On the other hand, a wrinkled pea has to have two copies of the recessive long SBE1 allele they must be homozygous recessive in order to exhibit that wrinkled phenotype. The lab suspects that the SBE1 gene is what Mendel was tracking in his experiment, that the capital A Mendel was studying is the short SBE1 allele, and that the lowercase a is the long SBE1 allele. But without access to the actual peas Mendel was using, there's no way to know for sure. In this lab, the fictional scenario is that some of Mendel's actual peas have been discovered, along with Mendel's handwritten notes about the peas genotypes. Even though you can only read some of his notes, this is exactly what we need to test the hypothesis that Mendel was tracking the SBE1 gene. In the lab, the students determine which SBE1 alleles the peas have and then compare that with Mendel's notes to see if the short and long SBE1 alleles match Mendel's big A and little a. This lab focuses on results, and the only procedure you need to do is gel electrophoresis, which we've already started. But the electrophoresis is the last step of an experimental chain, so I want to tell you what comes first. Broadly. DNA testing that uses gel electrophoresis as the readout happens in three steps. First, DNA is extracted from a biological sample, which in our case is the dried pea from Mendel's notebook. But pea plants have a lot of DNA, more than 4.45 billion base pairs. So finding just the DNA that we want to analyze is like searching for a needle in a haystack. Luckily, a powerful tool called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, allows scientists to make billions of copies of just the DNA that they want to study. In our case, we PCR'd the SBE1 gene. The last step is to run PCR samples on the gel, which is what we've already started. We can use gel electrophoresis to determine which SBE1 alleles the peas have because the alleles are different lengths. 
So remember, gel electrophoresis lets us separate DNA by length. So when we loaded our sample, while there might be DNA from both the short and long SBE1 allele, as these samples move through the gel, the short pieces travel faster and the long fragments more slowly. This separates the two SBE1 alleles, letting us identify them on the gel. So let's walk through an example of possible results. PA has two bands, which tells us that the SBE1 DNA was two sizes. It had a, a copy of the long allele and a copy of the short allele. This tells us that the P was heterozygous. So before uh, the P was ground down and the DNA was separated, one chromosome had a copy of the short SB1 allele and the other chromosome had a copy of the long SB1 allele. PB has one band which tells us that all of the SBE1 DNA was the same size. This tells us that this P was homozygous because the DNA traveled less distance. So we know it was the longer piece of DNA. So this P would be identified as homozygous uh, long SBE1. So again, for PB, both chromosomes have the long SBE1 allele. PC has one band, which tells us that the SBE1 DNA was all the same size. Again, this tells us that the P was homozygous for that uh, short SBE1 DNA. And again, because it, tra it traveled further, we know that all of the DNA in the sample was that shorter SBE1 allele. So for PC, we know that both chromosomes have the short SBE1 allele. What students do when they're performing this lab is they compare Mendel's notes with the gel results. This allows them to determine if the short and long allele of the SBE1 gene match with Mendel's big A and little a. Remember, Mendel's notes for P's four through six were illegible. But we can use what we know to fill in some info here. P's four and five were both round. So what can we deduce about both of their genotypes? Because round is the dominant trait, both P's four and five must have at least one copy of the dominant allele in order to exhibit that dominant phenotype. So they could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous because both of those have a copy of the dominant allele. But what about P6, which is wrinkled? Because wrinkled is the recessive trait, we know P6 has to have two copies of the recessive allele. It needs to be homozygous recessive in order to exhibit that recessive phenotype. So hopefully our gels have run long enough. I'll show you mine um, and then we'll take a photo, or we'll look, take a look at a photo of a gel I ran earlier. So as you can see, our samples have run long enough that we can see the difference between the long SBE1 allele and the short SBE1 allele. Remember the long SB1 allele would have gotten caught in the agarose and so would not have run as far. Whereas the short SB1 allele is going to have run farther because just like our toddler in a crowded room, it's going to be able to fit through those spaces on the agarose gel that the longer piece of DNA or the longer piece of dye, sorry, would not. Um, so at this point, what your students would do is they would take a picture of this gel so that they could use it to answer the post-lab questions and determine if the SBE1 alleles, the long and short alleles, matched with um, the big A and little a of Mendel's piece. Now I wanna point out um, 
that one of the great things about our dye labs is that the students just need to take a picture of this. As a matter of fact, what some of my students did in my classroom was they would take time lapses of this, but the students don't need anything else to visualize um, our samples. Because we're using dyes to simulate DNA, we can see uh, where the samples are the entire length of the run. And we can also see that some of our samples have um, just the long SBE1 allele. We can see that here with P3. We have some samples that just have the short SBE1 allele. We see that with P2. And we have some that have both. Um, and we can see that with P1. And so um, this is a great way for students to see how gel electrophoresis works. And it's an easy tool that the students can use to then see, um, do the, does the candidate gene actually match with what we saw with Mendel's peas? So you guys saw um, my gel. Here is an example of a gel that uh, we ran earlier and took a picture of. So again, you can see uh, that P's one, two, and three had the SBE1 alleles that we would expect based on Mendel's notebook. And now we're gonna analyze P's four, five, and six. The goal is to see if the genotypes that they have would have allowed for their phenotypes if the SBE1 allele was the A allele that Mendel was tracking with his round and wrinkled P's. So again, P's one, two, and three had SBE1 gene alleles that matched with the A alleles seen in Mendel's notes. P's one and two were both round, and so they had to uh, have at least one copy of the short SBE1 allele. P1 was heterozygous, and it had a long and short uh, copy of the SBE1 gene. P2 was homozygous dominant, and it had two copies of the short SBE1 gene. P3 was wrinkled, and so it was homozygous recessive, and so it had two copies of the long SBE1 gene. But what about P's four, five, and six? If the short allele of SBE1 was the dominant A allele for round phenotype, then all round P's should contain the short SBE1 allele. As you can see, the two P's which exhibited the round phenotype both had the short SBE1 allele. P4 and P5 both had one copy of the short allele and one copy of the long allele. So they were both heterozygous for um, the SBE1 gene or big A, little a uh, for Mendel. In addition, the wrinkled P had to have two copies of the long SBE1 allele if the long allele corresponded with the recessive A allele. Again, we see that the wrinkled P is homozygous for the long SBE1 allele. We have two copies, just as predicted if the SBE1 long allele was recessive for P shape. So to tie it all together, in the 1800s, Mendel figured out that having round P's was dominant, and he used the abbreviations big A and little a to track the inheritance of this trait. We now know that Mendel was tracking the inheritance of alleles. And the results of this lab show that Mendel's big A was the short allele of the SB1 gene, and the little a was the long allele of the SB1 gene. In essence, We've linked the allele symbols used by Mendel and Punnett squares with our modern understanding of DNA and inheritance. This is a section of the table of contents from a standard biology textbook. This lab is an excellent way to tie together these three essential topics in genetics. The lab guides for all of our labs are available at minipcr.com. On the Mendel's P store page, which is linked in the description below, you can find all of the lab curriculum available to download for free. 
This includes teacher guides, student guides, and editable classroom slides. It can all be found under the Curriculum Downloads tab. So the Mendel's Peas Lab is a beginner-friendly introduction to gel electrophoresis and how it can be used to aid in genotype identification. I told you at the beginning that it's based on authentic, real-world research. The concept behind the Mendel's Peas Lab is inspired by real research, which determined the gene associated with the round and wrinkled phenotype. This lab allows students to link the genes an organism carries to the actual phenotypes observed by Gregor Mendel. This is an electrophoresis lab that you'll be able to complete in a single class period. And because it's a dye-based lab, there's no need for any additional stains or visualization equipment. It's a beginner-friendly introduction to electrophoresis and how it can be used to aid in genotype identification. So what do you need to run this lab in your classroom? The Mendel's Peas Lab Kit includes the pre-aliquoted samples and all of the reagents to pour and run gels for eight student groups. Remember that because the lab uses dye samples, you don't need any other DNA stains or visualization equipment for your students to be able to see their results. In terms of equipment, you'll need pipettes, and a gel electrophoresis system. I use the mini pet uh, because it made it easy for the students to uh, pipette that 10 microliters. And also it teaches them how to use a standard pipette. And I use the bandit because it's our most accessible gel electrophoresis system at $85. But you can use any gel electrophoresis system you have in your classroom. We also have three other dye labs that you can use with your bandit. The Molecular Rainbow Lab focuses on the properties of molecules, with students separating colored dyes that have different charges and sizes. In my classroom, I use this to introduce my students to the concepts of gel electrophoresis and how the electrodes worked. The Cat Genetics Lab is another option to introduce students to Mendelian genetics, but instead of using Mendel's peas, you use a family of cats. The MicroPunters Lab focuses on the NASA research team that monitors the International Space Station for dangerous bacteria. As a special bonus, both the MicroPunters and Mendel's Peas dye electrophoresis labs are discounted in the mini PCR store until the end of 2023. If you're interested in our system and want a chance to get hands on with it yourself, you can sign up for a Bandit virtual workshop. We partner with Genes in Space, the free experimental design competition that MiniPCR runs in partnership with Boeing to put on virtual professional development sessions that familiarize you with new biotechnology and space biology research. For a $25 registration fee, we can ship you a bandit kit that you can keep and then join you in a virtual training session that walks you through a bandit experiment. For fall 2023, we will be holding a Bandit virtual workshop on Wednesday, November 15th. If you'd like to sign up, you can email outreach at minipcr.com. This wraps up our in-depth look at our new Mendel's Peas Lab. In the description below is linked to sign up for our newsletter, which allows you to be notified about new lab activities from MiniPCR. I want to thank you all for joining me and have a great day. Goodbye.